here. Okay, so good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Emma Griffiths, and I'm a researcher at Simon Fraser University here in Vancouver, Canada. And my work focuses on the development of data standards and ontologies for public health, one health, and food safety pathogen genomics. And so today's module, module three, is a topic that is very close to my heart. Uh, and we're going to be talking all about tools and processes for curating pathogen genomics data. So um, just a, a quick reminder, all the materials today are co covered under a, a Creative Commons license. You all know the spiel by now, so I'm not going to uh, go over that too much. Um, but what I do want to start off with is, uh, is an overview of the different kinds of things that we're going to be talking about today. Um, hopefully by the end of today's lecture, you will be able to understand the challenges of using genomics contextual data. So first of all, hopefully you'll know what genomics contextual data is, but then also what the challenges of using it for public health analyses are. Uh, you'll be able to describe the importance of data curation in public health. Uh, you'll know about ontologies, data standards, and tools that can be used for streamlining data flow. Uh, you'll be able to list off some real world examples of how ontology-based specifications are being used. Uh, you'll be aware of some data sharing principles and some practical ethical and privacy considerations. And uh, hopefully you'll know a little bit more about uh, public repositories and uh, the different submission requirements if you choose to share data, which hopefully you will. All right, so uh, to kick things off, we're going to start with defining contextual data. So when we talk about pathogen genomics, we are, of course, talking about the sequence data, but we're also talking about contextual data, which is the sample metadata, as well as different lab results, clinical and epidemiological data, and critically, methods information that are all needed for interpreting what's going on in the sequence data. And I think I'm probably preaching to the choir here to say that you can't do much with sequence data alone. But if you have good contextual data, there is a wide variety of different things that you can do and a lot of different questions that you can answer. Uh, some of those are on the slide here, um, and hopefully you will, have, you will have had experience with working with contextual data um, in your labs. So um, before we dive into standards and tools, I just want to stress why we are learning about, that, about data curations data curation and standards in this course. Um, and primarily that is because data standards and uh, data curation provide a quality framework for your contextual data. So just like you have QC for your sequence data, um, using data standards um, and, and data curation processes uh, help to improve your contextual data. It helps to provide auditability. Um, it helps to establish chains of custody. Um, and critically, it helps to future-proof these, uh, these assets. I mean, your, your sequence data and your contextual data uh, can be used to answer lots of different questions. The data can be used in lots of different ways, as we are learning in this course. Um, and making sure that you uh, standardize that the contextual data and, and store it in such a way that you are able to use it again and again and again in the future uh, really helps you get bang for the buck, all the bucks that you, and time, the, 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 the money, the time, the sweat, the energy that you put into generating that information, you're, that just helps to ensure that you're able to use it um, uh, in the future. So it's also part of best practices. Uh, the WHO put out a report in 2022 that stressed the importance of data quality and the use of data standards. And in the lab, if we have time, we'll go over uh, what some of those best practices are. Um, it's also a critical part of making your data findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Um, critically, curation and data standards help to improve efficiency. So there's a saying in data science, there's a, the 80-20 rule, and that's that 80% of your time is spent cleaning the data and 20% of your time is spent actually using and analyzing the data. Imagine if your data was stored in such a way that you could cut that data cleaning time in half. Imagine how much more you, time you would have to, to do other stuff with the data. Um, it helps to improve human and machine readability, um, and it helps to improve exchange of and data sharing. 
So critically, it all boils down to breaking down barriers. So using data standards helps to uh, helps to improve communication between data, data generators uh, and data users. It helps uh, with data flow and it helps to coordinate at local levels, national levels and beyond. So there are different kinds of data sharing. Uh, we know that different types of pathogen genomics data are generated by often by different individuals, different departments within a public health organization. And oftentimes that information needs to be shared within an organization, but sometimes subsets of that data need to be shared outside of that organization. And that can be with trusted partners, or it can be with public repositories or international agencies. Um, but critically, uh, everyone collects different kinds of information because they have different priorities, they use different systems, uh, they use different processes, and this creates a lot of data heterogeneity or, or variability in the data. Um, and the variability really comes from people using different fields, different terms, using different concepts, different formats to capture and store the data. And that really complicates using the data. Now, sometimes organizations can have their own data dictionaries, but often a lot of the time, this kind of information is captured using free text. And when you use free text, uh, that can be kind of problematic. Uh, often it's very error prone. Uh, you get different kinds of spelling mistakes, other kinds of errors. People like to use jargon um, depending on what field or discipline they're in. Uh, they also use, like to use shorthand. People are always trying to you know, save time. But there are also other types of issues. Uh, for example, something we call semantic ambiguity. So this is when the meaning of the words are not so clear. And this can happen when different labs use the same words to mean different things or they're using different words to use the same things. But we also get confusion um, and we understand the, the data differently when people use different classifications or use different concepts. They group data in different ways. Um, one of the examples I have here is, uh, it's very difficult to uh, understand the results of risk assessments when people are uh, classifying risk factors in different ways. And we've seen this before. Uh, some labs will uh, call risk factors, well, uh, they'll call exposures risk factors, while other labs will consider pre existing conditions to be risk factors. And there are other labs that, uh, that use both. And so when you group information or you group pick lists different, even for, differently, even for the same fields, that can make the interpretation of the data a lot more difficult. There's also uh, differences in granularity. Some people uh, collect and share information at very high levels, while others share very detailed information, and that sometimes can be hard to integrate and harmonize, and, and different formats. Don't get me started about dates. But all that variability that you find in private databases uh, just grows exponentially when you start to factor in public sharing. Um, and this is because all of the variability propagates out into these public repositories, and then uh, it just gets compounded. So you can see in the slide here, there are two different records that uh, I extracted from NCBI at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, we'll talk about variability in public records a little bit later in the, the lab component of module three, but you can see right off the bat that these are very different structures. And you can imagine that they would be very difficult to put together, just these two records. But you can imagine if you were collecting hundreds or even thousands of different variable records, this is gonna take a long time to clean up before you can use it. It can take hours, it can take days, it can even take weeks. And when you're in a public health emergency, you can't be taking that kind of time to be cleaning up data before you can be doing analyses and acting on it. So I kind of liken uh, uh, data structures and how they impact function to sort to protein, to protein structure and protein function. Um, the structure basically impacts the function and, and what you can do with either those proteins or, or uh, data. So uh, when things are not streamlined, uh, it's difficult to fit data together. Uh, and like I say, it takes time and resources to, to clean it up before you can use it. 
So uh, what are some solutions that we have to common contextual data challenges? Uh, we have things called ontologies. Uh, these are basically uh, collections of controlled vocabulary that act like universal languages for both humans and computers. And we'll go over this a little bit more detail in a second. Uh, we have data standards. So these are prescribed sets of fields, terms, and formats. Um, and we also have curation tools that basically implement the data standards. So these are packages of software as well as critically, as well as support materials to help put data standards into practice. Um, and these are all very technically based solutions, but a fourth component that actually should be divided up into many, many other components is the this idea of uh, there's more to implementing these technical solutions than just giving someone some software. Uh, you need this idea of consensus around the data standards, making sure they're fit for purpose. You need coordination across labs to make sure everyone is using compatible data standards. You need education. People know how, need to know how to use the data standards, where to find them. So there really is a large component of um, making the community aware, getting folks to, to use um, and implement the standards, to making sure that they're useful. Um, so the, the socio-political, the processes and the logistics of implementing data standards is really kind of an overlooked component of really making these, these technical solutions work. Okay, so ontology. Some of you may have uh, heard me do this spiel before. Um, so ontologies, like I said, are basically collections of controlled vocabulary that are linked together in hierarchies. So you can see a sort of mock beer ontology on the right-hand side of the screen. You can see uh, types of beer uh, at the bottom of the hierarchy, and th those are all linked uh, to a very ge general concept of beer at the top of the hierarchy. Um, the, the critical thing about ontologies is that uh, these fields and terms are meant to be universal. They're not just an organization-specific uh, language. Um, they're meant to mean the same thing no matter who's talking about these concepts. Um, all of the fields and terms are given uh, a universal identifier. Um, which can help distinguish between the meanings of different fields and terms. You can also incorporate different labels or different synonyms so that you can, uh, organizations can use the language that they're used to using, but everybody is using the same identifier. And so everybody can equate uh, the, the different labels and the different synonyms. And this helps to, to enable and build interoperability between data sets um, and systems. Um, now, you can build an ontology any way that you want. Uh, not all ontologies are created equal, but if you subscribe to particular communities of practice like we do in our lab, um, there are principles and practices that you can use to help build ontologies in inter interoperable ways. So we are big believers in the OVO foundry way of doing things. So this is the open biological and biomedical ontology foundry. This is a collection of scientists that have built over 200 different interoperable ontologies on basically anything that you can think of, geography, anatomy, uh, food, anything, lots and lots of different things that you can use to create data standards. Um, there's also different tools and languages. There's registries and portals that, that enable you to help search for the different fields and terms that you want. So basically, by using ontologies, there's a whole system and, a, and whole communities out there to, to help support you implement these things. Okay, so one example of an ontology-based data standard or data specification is ISO 23418. And this is a standard that came out a couple of years ago. Uh, it was put together by ISO, which is the International Organization for Standards. This is a group that, design, that de develops standards when there's an identified market need, really to help uh, improve quality and reproducibility uh, of information and goods. And so there, it was identified that there was a need for uh, some requirements and guidance for the implementation of whole genome sequencing for characterizing uh, bacteria in food. And so 
Um, there are a lot of member states involved in ISO, so that there are there's contributions from lots of different countries, representation of a lot of different industry partners, academics, uh, and so on. And so the ISO standard was built with a lot of different input um, from a lot of different organizations, a lot of different folks. There, it's There's three parts. There's one that has uh, guidance and requirements for a wet lab, for the bioinformatics processing of sequence data, and finally for metadata. And our lab was involved in developing the, the metadata component. Um, and really the, the crux of the matter is that the metadata component consists of a series of field of tables and annexes that contain fields that to just that describe the sample, uh, the isolate and the sequence. Um, and the, the, there's a sample of the contextual data fields uh, on in the box on the left hand side of the slide to give you a bit of a flavor of what the ISO standard contains. Um, and all of the fields were decided on after uh, a lot of review and consultation, um, and that's a big part of standards development. Um, and there, it, these are all ontology based, and there is a software file called an ISO SLIM, where subsets of ontology terms have been brought together into a package, and that's included with the documentation of the ISO standard, and uh, different labs can implement that ISO SLIM, however they see fit, um, in order to meet the requirements of the, of the ISO standard. Um, I should just say that uh, while labs can be accredited for ISO standards, you can actually uh, get the benefits of implementing the standard without going through all of the steps of accreditation. Okay, so just to uh, emphasize this point, um, I'm just, uh, comparing and contrasting ontologies and specifications here, because this is something that kind of gets muddled very often when you're when you're talking to folks. Um, on the left hand side, you can see an example of an ontology. There, the hierarchy there is representing different kinds of sequencing instruments. Um, it's being visualized by an ontology lookup service. Uh, you can see the hierarchy on the left there. I know the the writing is kind of small, um, but on the right hand side, there are some uh, annotations. Um, so really, ontologies are conceptual in nature. They're encoded using um, web ontology language. There are certain kinds of tools to be able to work with them and edit them. Um, and they really include, like I've said, logic, synonyms, annotations, um, and hierarchies. Um, but on the right-hand side of the screen, uh, under the specifications, uh, you can see that the specs are really a, more prescriptive. So whereas ontologies are conceptual, specifications contain things like data types, rules, patterns, maximum, minimums, um, and they use different formats. So the, the data spec that you can see being visualized here um, is, uh, is in JSON format. Um, now, specifications can be uh, provided to, to you or to, to anyone else. Um, as a data dictionary, maybe it's in a spreadsheet, but it can also come just like in a, in a uh, in a file as well. Um, so none of these things allow you to enter data. You can't really work with them. A software developer could work with the specifications. A philosopher can work with the ontologies. But what you need to be able to work with these tools it, or with these packets of information it are tools and data management systems. So there's a wide variety of different kinds of tools and data management systems that can implement ontology-based specifications that are out there. Some are very simple, like spreadsheets. Some are more complex, like lab information management systems and, and public databases. Um, but there are also different kinds of tools that are out there to help curate and manage data. Um, there are some of them we've already mentioned. There are lookup services, curation tools, validation tools, transformation tools, mapping tools. There are lots of ways to work with and to curate and validate data. There are lots of things out there, but we're I'm going to give you one example. Uh, and this one example of a, of a tool is called the data harmonizer. So this is basically like a spreadsheet style text editor that implements data standards and specifications and enables users to enter data to validate it uh, using different curation features, 
uh, the tool comes with a whole suite of uh, guidance, curation, standard operating procedures, training materials. Um, but critically, it's got standardized fields, pick lists, um, and you can work with it in a way that public health folks are generally used to working with data. It's very easy to use. Um, and the data isn't stored in the data harmonizer. Data passes through the data harmonizer. So you can open a file, edit it, validate, do whatever you want, and then you save it to your local machine. Um, but I would say the coolest part of the data harmonizer is that it enables automated transformations. So we know that data needs to go to different places downstream. Um, there could be different databases that you need to submit to, and they all have different uh, submission requirements. And for you to reformat the data um, over and over again to meet those requirements is a, not a good use of your time. And so uh, one of the things that the data harmonizer enables you to do is by clicking one button, it automates the transformation into um, commonly used um, formats. So you can enter the data once and you can export it in a lot of different ways. And if you are interested in learning more about that, um, I've included the link to the manuscript here, but we're also going to be exploring the data harmonizer uh, as well as some of the data specifications within it later and on today in the lab. Okay, so uh, now I want to give you some real world examples of how implementing ontology based specifications are happening right now within public health uh, for pathogen surveillance. And we're going to talk about four different specifications for four different types of pathogen surveillance. Okay, so before we dive into the different use cases, I have to say that all of the specifications that we're going to discuss uh, were created in the same way. They're based on that ISO standard that I mentioned. Um, they, when we first went to, to create data specifications to uh, support pathogen surveillance, we wanted to start with something that was already vetted internationally, that already had a lot of feedback, um, and, and so it would be a really solid place to start. And so when we were going through the ISO standard, it's all tables and annexes. It doesn't really, it, it's, it's hard to visualize how to put such a thing into practice sometimes. And so when we started to group the different fields thematically, suddenly we realized that we could create a modular framework. And as soon as we did that, we realized even though the ISO standard is geared towards foodborne pathogens, that actually we could use this framework for anything. Um, and you can see the different kind of thematic modules that I'm talking about on the right-hand side of the screen. The ones in black are sort of the agnostic modules. But we realized that we could enrich the framework by adding on new modules or by enriching specific modules with extra fields and terms or removing fields and terms to, to suit whatever surveillance uh, was needed to be performed. So all of the specifications that I'm gonna show you are based on this interoperable modular framework. Um, all of the modules are populated with ontology-based fields and terms. Um, but one thing that I wanted to stress is that um, in the, the process of developing data standards isn't just creating collections of fields and terms. Um, there's a there's a lot of consultation that needs to happen. The first thing when you build a data specification is you need to perform a data needs assessment. So you need to work with people who are going to be implementing the data standard to make sure that it's fit for purpose. Are you capturing the right kinds of data and are you structuring it in a way that helps to enable analyses? So um, there's a lot of consultation involved. You have to test it out. <laughs> you have to get those folks that you consulted to actually try it out um, and make, make sure that there's consensus around uh, how you've built the spec. And you need tools. People need a clear path to implementation in order to get that uptake that we were talking about before. Okay, so the benefits of using interoperable data standards are many. So 
we had, like I said, we had that framework and we were able to use it over and over again in the four different examples that I'm going to get to in just a sec. Um, but the benefits of doing that is that um, you reusing the same framework and just altering it helps to reduce the time, the workload, and the uncertainty associated with using brand new specifications. Every time someone starts up a pathogen surveillance um, initiative, there has there's almost always a bit of an argument and there's some confusion and you have to do a lot of work to get consensus around what the minimal metadata is going to be um, and so on. And so once you've kind of already established that, you can reuse fields and terms, you can reuse tools, you can reuse training, you can reuse protocols, as well as agreements, expectations, and skill sets. So having that interoperable data standard saves you time, not just during curation, but, but in an array of, in, in, in many, many other ways. Okay, so the first example that we're going to talk about is implementing ontology-based specifications during the pandemic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the specification and how it was used, and then I'm gonna tell you an overarching lesson that we learned when we implemented those specifications. Um, the spec was used in Canada, but it was also internationalized, and we're going to talk about that. Um, if you're interested, I'm going to go through it really quickly, but if you're interested in learning more about how data specifications were used during the pandemic or uh, how Canada conducted its pathogen genomic surveillance, um, I've highlighted two episodes of uh, the MicroBinFi podcast where we did interviews. Um, so episode 26 and 53 are uh, really... I don't know, they're a fun listen, but I'm kind of biased. <laughs> uh, if you're not listening to the MicroBinFi podcast, um, they get on experts pretty much every week, and they talk a lot about lots of different kinds of bioinformatics topics, uh, from tools, best practices, um, what's going on in the world, and it's, it's, it's a fun listen. So I do recommend that you check that out. Okay, so um, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, an initiative called Cancogen, or the Canadian COVID-19 Genomics Network, was launched. Um, so this was basically uh, an infusion, an injection of funds from the federal government to help support different activities, but uh, one of the most important was supporting um, genomic surveillance of SARS-CoV-2 across Canada. So what was happening, and this is very general, <laughs> there were a lot of different situations, but in general, uh, samples were collected um, on the front lines in clinics and hospitals, um, and the residual samples, the samples that were left over from diagnostic testing, were sent to uh, public health labs, provincial public health labs, and their academic partners for sequencing. Um, now, the types of contextual data that were being collected were very much geared towards the public health priorities of the provinces at that time. So just in case people aren't familiar, uh, health is under uh, provincial jurisdiction in Canada. So they get to decide what, what's collected, they get to decide what is shared. And as we've already discussed before, uh, we know that information is collected in very different systems, it's, it's uh, stored in very different ways. So we knew that um, if we wanted to put all of that data together in a common national genomics database uh, hosted at the NML, um, that we were going to need to figure out a way to, to harmonize all of that information. And not only did that data need to go into the National Genomics Database to understand how COVID was getting into Canada, how it was evolving, um, how it was moving around, and how we could possibly stop it, we also needed to share that data with a number of different downstream public repositories so that, so that the world could be doing global surveillance and Canada could be at the forefront of that effort. Um, so right off the bat, we knew that comparing data from all of the different partners was gonna be comparing apples to oranges, to goji berries, to bananas. And so we were tasked with figuring out how to uh, fix the situation. And so we, based on that modular interoperable framework, we created a data specification uh, called the Cancogen SARS-CoV-2 Contextual Data Standard. We implemented it in the data harmonizer, which was shared with all of the different uh, data generating partners. Um, but it didn't stop there. 
we realized very quickly that even if you have a data standard and a tool to put it into practice, um, there can be a lot of reasons for this, but people can also often find creative ways <laughs> to, to still be submitting variable data. And so we also uh, provided curation services, which helped to, well, I, I'm again, I'm biased, but I would say it helped to streamline data flow from the provinces to the national database and then, and then beyond as well. Um, so um, only, because we were able to put the specification together very quickly, um, and there was interest in being able to streamline data flow around the world, um, we were facing challenges that everyone else and all the other countries around the world were facing. Um, I uh, am part of an organization called the Public Health Alliance for Genomic Epidemiology, or FAGE, and I chair the Data Structures Working Group. And we were chatting about these sort of global challenges, and I mentioned that we had this data standard that we were using in Canada, and there was a lot of interest around internationalizing that standard so that everybody could get the benefits that Canada was getting. Um, and so that's something that we did, and we uh, there were lots of different labs around the world that were implementing the standard either almost in its entirety or in parts, and they included folks like the US CDC, uh, Australian Public Health and their Austraca data sharing platform, uh, Baobab Limbs in South Africa, Nigeria, Argentina, parts were implemented at NCBI, and so on. So um, really the take home message here is that the data standard was helping to uh, streamline harmonization across labs in Canada, but also around the world. Okay, so we haven't really looked at any of the specifications in a lot of detail so far in how they help to uh, harmonize data and, and some of the, the tricky uh, challenges that uh, we see commonly in contextual data. So that's what I wanna show you. Uh, with the second use case, which is around um, MPOX. So in July of 2020, we were still in the midst. We were just sort of coming out of the pandemic. Uh, this is when the World Health Organization declared MPOX, formerly known as monkeypox, to be a public health emergency of international concern. So uh, it was quickly identified that uh, there would be a need for genomic surveillance of MPOX, um, so let, I should just say MPOX is the disease and MPXV is the virus that causes MPOX. Um, so if you see those different terms, you understand what I'm talking about here. So um, in order to support this genomic surveillance, uh, we were tasked with developing a specification that could be implemented in the data harmonizer. So we created a, a new template based on that interoperable modular framework. Um, and it was actually very quick to do because um, we really, a lot of the fields and terms that we used for SARS-CoV-2 were very similar to what we needed for MPOX. We just really needed to update the pick lists. Um, so for example, whereas SARS-CoV-2 was really heavy on respiratory sampling um, for MPOX, it was, there's a lot of groins. There's a lot of groin stuff for MPOX. So um, all this to say, uh, uh, yeah, it was very quick just by uh, updating the, the pick lists. So what are some of the data challenges that we were able to solve using the specification? So one thing that I wanted to highlight was variable sample descriptions. So I'm sorry if this is really small and you're having trouble seeing it, but hopefully you can see uh, in the top box on the left-hand side, there is a bunch of sample descriptions, real life sample descriptions that we were uh, that we were given to curate. And you can see that there are, it's free text, there's a mixture of uh, devices, there's a mixture of anatomical parts, of uh, different kinds of uh, pustules and, and uh, different phenotypes, uh, different locations in the body, whether it's the, like the right or the left. Um, and then there's also different biomaterials. So this is what you're starting with. Um, and we needed to make sense of that. And there's also French and English in there as well. So uh, basically we have a set of six fields that could that, that really could handle 
uh, the majority of all of the variability in these different types of sample descriptions. And you can see them here. Um, we, different kinds of anatomical materials. So that's kind of tissues and, and, and substances from the body, then anatomical parts. Those are locations in the body. So your leg, your head, uh, your lung, um, collection devices. Now you'll see here that not all of these fields apply to all of the samples. You only need to fill in, in the specification, the things that apply to your sample. However, you can't tell this here. You'll see it later on when we do the lab. Um, most of all of these fields are considered to be required. And that's just because we want you to address them. The specifications are great ways to enable communication between downstream data users and upstream data generators. And so by making these fields required, you prompt people to provide some kind of information. Um, so in this case, you'll see a lot of not applicables, and that's because, because the required fields, you have to put something in there where we have a standardized set of null values. So um, people can just provide the, the standardized null values here. So the second type of challenge uh, that, this, that the specification helps to address is methodological. So sometimes uh, specimens are processed in some way that can affect the outcome, can affect sequencing downstream. Um, and for example, uh, there, were, there was a lot of pooling of samples uh, that was happening. And there was no, up until this point, there was no standardized way to record this information. Uh, another thing that happens is that uh, people can be sampling different areas of the body of, of, of the same person, and there wasn't a way to connect those and link those samples to the same person. Um, or they can be longitudinally surveying something, like a, like a person. And so you, maybe you're sampling someone every two weeks to see whether they, are, they have a chronic infection or to understand if they're being uh, reinfected. And so we were able to uh, include fields called specimen processing. We were able to include host subject IDs as mechanisms for um, capturing uh, specimen processing information and also for linking uh, sampling to the same host. Um, another uh, challenge was going beyond clinical samples. So we have this nice structure for when we're talking about people, um, but when it came to MPOX, uh, people were very interested in understanding if they if uh, the infection could be transmitted uh, by inanimate objects, so whether bed linens or clothing or kitchen utensils. Um, also, uh, if the infection could be transmitted by other animals like pets or food production animals. Um, and, and whether it was present in the environment. So um, by incorporating a few, just a couple of extra fields, we were able to enable One Health comparisons. So One Health is uh, this approach that acknowledges that human health, animal health, and environmental health are all interlinked. So as soon as you impact the health of one of those things in the triangle, the others are gonna be affected as well. So we were able to standardize um, samples beyond human clinical samples and um, in, in a similar way that would enable integration of data from a wide variety of different sample types. So if you're interested in actually seeing real life data in the wild, uh, you can go to NCBI. I've included the Canada's uh, MPOX bio project there. You can look up, you can see the actual bio samples. Um, if you want to see the standard that we used, uh, I'm, I've included the GitHub repo there as well. Okay, so the third use case is One Health approaches to understanding antimicrobial resistance. Um, and the lessons that we learned here is that uh, there's rarely a one size fits all approach to implementation. Um, people need different options. Um, it, it, there's no one standard to rule them all and that is okay. And I'm gonna talk about what I mean by that and how that uh, really reinforces the importance for being able to map an exchange between different formats. 
And the, our third lesson that came out of this initiative and this project was uh, our understanding for the need of formalizing the curation and coordination role in, in, in research, but also in, in pathogen genomic surveillance. Okay, so uh, this initiative was uh, based on a genomics research and development initiative that uh, these are these are initiatives that are uh, funded um, to support federal cooperation um, in investigating uh, certain phenomena using genomics. And so the goal of the GRDI AMR, was to use genomics and harmonized contextual data to understand how antimicrobial resistance was um, being introduced into uh, the Canadian food supply and the environment, how it was evolving, how it was moving around, and how it ultimately impacted human health, and to possibly identify interven interventions to slow down or stop AMR spread. So the scope was looking at bacteria. Um, the data was being provided by a lot of different federal agencies across a lot of different sectors, a lot of different commodities, so different types of food, different environments, uh, whether those were pro production environments uh, or uh, natural environments, um, a lot of different hosts. Uh, so you can imagine <laughs> there are a lot of different systems, a lot of different data types captured in all kinds of ways. Um, this was extremely challenging, and uh, there was a lot of different agencies that were that were participating, um, and so we were tasked with uh, designing a data specification to help harmonize all of that crazy data that had to come together to be able to answer uh, answer these really important questions. Um, right, and so we used our interoperable modular framework um, and updated it by adding in, in extra modules and enriching and, and deleting as necessary from the existing modules to gear everything now towards uh, foodborne pathogens in One Health. Um, I'm not going to show you the standard. Um, you can go and look that up if you're interested. Uh, but what I did want to highlight was uh, the need for different implementation options. So something that I mentioned earlier was the need uh, for a clear path to implementation if you want people to use data standards. And some of the challenges that we learned about were that there are basically three different situations that we needed to address. Um, one is that there are very spreadsheet-based labs, um, and we can offer spreadsheet-based templates uh, for them based on standards. Uh, we've done that before. Um, so for the GRDI, we provided actually an Excel sheet with drop-down menus uh, at the start of the project, um, but then the amount of, of standardization that needed to happen, sort of the, the spreadsheet got too big, and so we offered a template in the data harmonizer. So that's one mechanism of implementa implementing standards. But a big issue that we had to address was this idea that all of these different organizations have invested in different information management systems and different processes already. So if they already have a way of doing things, how can we impose this new data standard on these ex existing systems? And the solution here was to not interrupt data flow, um, routine data flow within an organization but rather focus on when data leaves the organization. That's when you can be using tools to automate transformations and to get it into a standardized format that um, is a common language between different organizations. So this is when mapping and interchange formats and the automated transformation that the data harmonizer offers really started to come into play. So that was the second mechanism of implementing standards. The third was, when when you have a, a clean slate, when organizations want to develop a whole new brand new database, they can be using data standards as the basis for their schemas. Um, and this is really powerful because ontology based database schemas open up your world to a whole new variety of analyses and data linkage. 
Um, and you can have graph databases and things that Will was talking about in yesterday's lecture, artificial intelligence. Um, so this is, this is very empowering. So these are the three different strategies we use to help all of these different organizations put uh, the GRDI uh, One Health AMR standard into practice. Um, so something that we mentioned in the last slide was the importance of mapping and exchange. So um, we had implemented different solutions for different labs uh, in different organizations within Canada. But something we needed to consider was the need to exchange data with countries outside of Canada. Uh, and one use case was exchanging data with our neighbors in, to the south, uh, which is, of course, the U.S. Um, now, the U.S., when they are monitoring AMR, um, whether it's the USDA or the CDC or the FDA, there's usually very particular sites that they're monitoring. And so they have very specific questions that they're trying to answer with their data collection. Whereas in the GRDI, um, this was uh, meant to be uh, very integrative. So we were, we were asking big questions. We were integrating lots of different kinds of data. Um, and so we, would we used what we refer to as an integrative approach, whereas uh, the US uses what we would have referred to as a disaggregative approach. So they would have lots of different specific fields in their data standard, whereas that would equate or be able to be mapped to a single field in our data standard. But luckily, uh, both of the teams that were developing One Health standards in Canada and also in the US are really buy into the ontology-based approach. And because of the hierarchies that are available in those ontologies, we had a whole hackathon to be able to map and understand each other's data standards. We were able to develop mapping and exchange formats that would enable the sharing of data between the US and Canada. So that mapping really helps to relate concepts to each other as well as fields, and that helps to create interoperability. Um, another thing that we learned was the importance of uh, formalizing curation rules uh, in pathogen genomics. So often there are different gen data generators and partners. They all have different data needs. Um, everybody is busy. There's a lack of awareness about which standards are really appropriate and which ones to use, how to customize them, how to implement them, how to update them. Um, there's not necessarily knowledge of semantic best practices. You always have to troubleshoot when you're doing curation or you're just designing a standard or you're implementing it. And the result is that curation and contextual data in general end up being treated like a second class citizen. People curate at five minutes to five on Friday before they have to submit. There's not a lot of, it's not, it's not the top of people's minds. People have other concerns. And so the solution in the GRDI was to have dedicated personnel for identifying and implementing standards. Um, and there was a general feeling after this experience that this should be, you should have such people embedded in every project and program. And there should be resources that are allocated for curation and for data standards. And this, you know, everybody's busy. So if you have one person that's in charge of doing these things, um, that helps take the load off, but also make sure that it gets done in a, in a well thought out way. Okay, so the fourth example is wastewater. So um, we're going to talk about a wastewater specification that we developed. Um, and the lessons that we learned from this was that uh, curation and data standards help to reduce data wild wests, and that consensus is really key in developing and implementing standards. So before we get into that, um, I just wanted uh, to be clear about what I mean by uh, sewage, uh, by wastewater. So traditionally, when you say wastewater, you're talking about sewage, but increasingly, um, what we mean when we say wastewater is just used water. And when we start to recognize wastewater as used water, that really opens the door to a whole new vast array of data types and uh, sampling strategies. But basically, 
um, the importance of wastewater is that pathogens are often shed in uh, human waste. Um, and if you're looking, if you're exploring waste, um, you can be identifying many threats at once in the same sample. It's a great way to do community-based surveillance and also surveillance of pathogens that could be coming from other sources like other animals or might be present in the environment. Um, now, while um, doing wastewater genomic surveillance is technically challenging, um, oftentimes there are fewer privacy complications for data sharing compared to doing clinical surveillance and sharing information related to humans. And because of this, there have been a lot of different academic projects and public health initiatives in Canada, but also globally, um, to perform wastewater genomic surveillance. And the thing is that they're largely happening in silos. No one's so much talking to each other about how they're doing these things. Um, and there's kind of a lack of consensus about vocabulary and how to be structuring information. And so what ends up happening is you have a real, what we call a data wild west. There's, there's, there's a lot of mess and this creates a missed opportunity for surveillance. Don't worry, we used our interoperable modular framework to create a wastewater specification to help solve a lot of the data challenges in wastewater. We're not going to talk about that right now, but you're going to see that later in the lab. Um, one of the take home messages was that wastewater is complex. There are multiple communities who are using wastewater to monitor a lot of different things. It can be for AMR, it can be for pathogens can be for uh, different kinds of chemicals, drug use. Uh, there are a lot of different communities that are surveying a lot of different things. Um, and so when you get this vast array of different uh, labs in different communities using this technique, um, when you're creating a data standard, consensus is really important. Um, it's really about building relationships. And uh, we've mentioned, I mentioned this before, but I really want to stress the importance of consultation making sure that data specs are fit for purpose um, and providing data generators who are working with you on this uh, opportunities for co-creation. Um, also, it's important to talk to people directly because sometimes, um, it, sometimes people will say that they need one thing, um, but really you need to do a lot of talking with them to understand that, that sometimes they need um, something else. Um, I put some points in here um, because I've been asked before about how we how we get consensus on data standards um, for them to be to, to be used widely. Um, and I, I guess what I wanted to say here is that it it does involve a lot of talking and a lot of compromise. Um, people are usually not bad actors. It's just as something we've already said before, they need a clear path to implementation and hopefully an easy one. They need to be able to see how they can implement a data standard that you're creating without it ruining all of their routine operations. So sometimes um, getting consensus involves you uh, coming up with a new solution because people will always come to you with a situation that you didn't know about, you didn't realize. So sometimes you have to compromise, but sometimes it's a matter of education. Um, uh, sometimes you need to, sometimes people just don't understand what you're talking about. And so you need to maybe do demonstrations or uh, curate some data for them and show them um, how beneficial the, the data standard is. So anyway, consensus is key. It's all about building relationships. Um, and that's really important for implementing data standards and for getting buy-in for data curation. So um, I know we're getting short on time and I want to power through these next few slides. Um, so best practices for data curation can probably be summed up in the following way. Uh, you need to be aware of, be aware of the FAIR principles um, and the importance of interoperable data and data standards. Um, a best practice is to use data standards, um, implement them uh, in your curation practices and tools, and use the tools in your routine practice. Um, it's important to advocate for a formalized curation role in your organization. Um, and it's also really, really critical for um, data curators and public health organizations to be communicating with standards and tools developers to make sure that they know uh, what the needs are and how they evolve over time. 
Okay, so I want to sh quickly shift gears. So far, we've been talking about the curation of public health data. Uh, now I just want to talk a little bit about curation of, of knowledge bases. And uh, these practices overlap, but they're a little bit different. So when I talk about public health data, what I mean is uh, empirical observations, measurements, de derived results um, that public health labs collect based on their surveillance practices. That data uh, can be synthesized into facts. And those facts can be stored in libraries known as knowledge bases. Um, and so you can think about uh, the public health data is used to build knowledge bases, and the knowledge bases then are used to inform um, the interpretation of public health data. And so you have this very sort of cyclical um, relationship between knowledge bases and public health data. So I want to uh, just give you an example of best practices for curation of knowledge bases, and this is based on um, the activities the curation activities of, of the comprehensive antibiotic resistance database, a beautiful database that you're gonna learn more about in module seven. Um, so I'm, I'm gonna go through this very quickly. Um, so CARD is, is complicated and it, it can do a lot of different wonderful, wonderful things. Um, and I'm going to do it the disservice of, of just summarizing it in a really, really basic way. But basically, you can think of CARD as a database that links genes and mutations with drugs, mechanisms of action, and, and a whole lot more. And this knowledge base uh, is really used to underpin the resistance gene identifier. So this is a tool that I think you're going to explore in Module 7 for predicting uh, resistance determinants. Um, so the, the CARD knowledge base has its own data model, um, so all the information is structured using the ARO, which is the antibiotic resistance ontology, and all of the facts that go into the knowledge base come from the literature. Um, and so everything, all of the facts are evidence-based, and you need a set of curators to go and identify those facts and, and, and integrate them into the, the database. And so the quality of the data in the database is really dependent on the curation practices used to, to identify those facts. Um, and so you need really good curation systems um, to ensure the quality of the, of the database. So um, just some best practices uh, for curating data in knowledge bases. Um, first of all, you have to be very specific about the kinds of things that you're going to include in your knowledge base. So you've really got to scope out what kinds of facts you're going to include and which facts don't uh, don't make the cut. Um, you have to have rules for this and cutoffs. Um, and when you're working with uh, humans, when you're working with different curators, you have to have examples that can clearly show when you include something and when you don't. Um, you need trusted sources of facts and evidence. Um, and so using things like scientific literature, the, those are good sources of trusted evidence. Um, but sometimes, depending on what knowledge base you're curating, that's not necessarily available. So for example, when we were curating food information um, and agriculture information, sometimes there are, there's vocabulary that's used that's not really available in the literature. And so then you have to start to look around at Wikipedia or you have to sometimes use agricultural magazines and, and things like that. So there is definitely a hierarchy of, of trusted sources, but needs, needs must. Um, also another important principle for uh, curating knowledge bases is consistency. So, making sure that you have proper examples and well-documented rules so that different curators, I mean, curators have to interpret what they're finding out in the literature or, or out in the wild. Um, and so you need, you, need, um, you need great instructions, but even better than that is if you can automate that with some sort of tooling. And CARD does a really great job of all of these things. And then finally, you need to make sure that you're versioning um, all of your different uh, all of the different versions of your knowledge base so that whenever there are changes, people can identify when they happened and what those changes were. Um, so if you use these different curation best practices, hopefully you end up with a great open, interoperable, and useful knowledge base that can turn 
public health data into facts and actionable knowledge. Okay, quickly, uh, data sharing. <laughs> um, so I'm not here to, to try to force you to share data. No one can tell you you have to share data. Um, but what I do want to do is try to convince you that it's a good idea. So why should you share data? What are the benefits? Um, the first is situational awareness. So lack of sharing data creates blind spots. So if you're not sharing data, people don't know what's happening in your region. And so they may be making decisions based on what's happening everywhere else that is not beneficial or may not be reflective of what's happening in your region. Um, one of the downfalls of that, um, so this is this is really written um, with respect to, to the pandemic. Um, if people are using available data to design diagnostics and therapeutics, if, if data representing what's happening in your region or the viruses that are in your region or with the pathogens, um, if, there, if there are folks out there that are designing diagnostics and therapeutics, what's happening in your region may not be represented. And so those diagnostics and therapeutics may not be so effective um, against the pathogens that are in your area, not as 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 effective as they are elsewhere. And so that's not great. Um, it also, sharing data also gives you a voice in the global decision-making scheme of things. Data creates leverage, it gives you power and sharing it gives you a say, gives you power. Um, there have also been arguments made that data sharing um, is part of uh, is, a, is, a, is a way to support human rights. Um, there was a very nice piece put out by the Global Alliance for Genomics and Health that sort of frames data sharing um, in a human rights framework, but it also kind of it lays out the, um, the responsibilities and the rights of data generators and data users. Um, and so it's a really nice read, um, I recommend. Uh, you, you take a look at it, look at it if you have the chance. And also sharing data, it's just, it's, it makes sense and it's uh, part of being a good data citizen. So uh, data stewardship uh, is really important. Uh, good data, steward, do, data stewardship will depend on uh, jurisdictional policies, organizational data sharing policies. Uh, so those really kind of supersede anything. Um, there are also other uh, documents that are out there that uh, are a little bit more can offer a little bit more specific advice about um, how to um, steward data. Um, I don't have time to go in all into all of those things, but as you all are really on the front lines um, and have your fingers on the keyboards and are really working with the data directly, I thought I would give you a few rules of thumb for good data stewardship practices. Um, the first thing is to keep in mind that public trust is essential um, and loss of trust um, in public health organizations can have a lot of consequences. Um, if people don't think that you're protecting their data uh, properly, um, they can, it can negatively impact um, them going for tests. It can put them off um, complying with public health um, uh, messaging or public health interventions. Uh, but on the flip side, um, if uh, the public doesn't feel like you're sharing data and they think that you're you're hold, they're, you're holding things back, they may not think that you're being transparent, and that can um, adversely impact public trust as well. So finding the right balance is is tricky, but it's important. So rules of thumb: um, don't share uh, identifiable information. So de-identify everything, no names and addresses when you're sharing. Um, be careful of small case numbers. Um, if, if there are small case numbers, you might want to double check the granularity of your geographical location information that you're sharing or the times that you're sharing, um, because these might become a little bit more identifiable. Um, you might want to also check the combinations of, of uh, information fields, which may not be identifiable by themselves, but once you start to put those together, um, in, when you have a small number of cases, then some, sometimes uh, it can start to be identifiable. Um, always track identifiers. Um, this establishes uh, chains of custody. 
But when you're just be careful when you're sharing identifiers, because sometimes some organizations consider personal health IDs or sample IDs to be personal health identifiable information. Um, and so if you have any questions about any of these things, the best thing to do is to consult your privacy officer, um, but also any of the any jurisdictional policies that you have access to and any national legislation. Um, in terms of making sure that all of your data is good quality and secure, collect as much information as you can about data provenance. So how it was generated, who was doing it, uh, the methods. This really, really helps to support attribution, auditability, reproducibility, and accountability. If you ever have to go to court, which hopefully you never do, you're going to want to make sure that you have really strong records. Um, Right, contextual data sometimes requires uh, higher security. I would say always, almost always, your contextual data is going to have um, higher security restrictions than your sequence data. Um, uh, another good rule of thumb is to uh, correct errors whenever you identify them and to uh, update them as soon as they're identified. And the issue is, is that data, when you're sharing, it can propagate out to many different places really quickly. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it can be tricky to do, but um, if you can correct those errors in the different public repositories that you've shared with, um, that's, that's good practice. Um, okay, I know we need to get to the lab. Um, so I'm going to try to wrap this up really quickly. Um, I just want to emphasize uh, the types of contextual data that are usually easy to share versus those that are a little bit more tricky to share. Um, the, the bigger text, the stuff at the top is usually easier to share. And when you get to the bottom, those are usually uh, the types of data that are a little bit more tricky to share. So things like uh, sampling locations, uh, sample collection dates to the day, um, attribution information. So who collects the samples, who sequences it, methods, um, software types, usually you will have permission to share those things. And those are pretty, um, those are the least controversial things. Um, when you get to things like sampling strategies or hosts and their demographics, uh, sample types, and any kind of accompanying quality or diagnostic indicators, um, usually you can share those things. Um, and, and it may depend on who you're sharing with. Maybe you can't share those publicly. Maybe you can share those in a trusted network. But when you get to things that are very informative, like vaccinations or exposures or travel histories, this is the kind of stuff that you can do a lot of analysis with, but being able to share this information is very, very tricky. So, um, okay. Submitting to public repositories is crucial for global surveillance. Uh, there are a lot of different public repositories out there. Um, there are ones that we have already discussed, like the INSDC, and I think uh, it was mentioned yesterday about GISAID. Uh, but there, there are other repositories. A lot of them are organism specific uh, that are out there. We don't have time to talk about all of those. Um, but all of this to say, we're going to focus on GISAID and, and the INSDC. Um, just to know, as we've already mentioned, uh, all of these different repositories, while they have overlapping requirements, uh, their modes of submission and the actual requirements are different. Um, but generally speaking, uh, if you want to submit to either the INSDC or to GISAID, what you're going to need to do is create an account, prepare your contextual data and your sequence data, and then use whatever system or portal they provide to be able to upload. Um, you know what, I'm going to motor through this a little bit. GISAID, I just want to highlight a few critical differences. Um, if you're going to submit data to GISAID, um, you, there is, you have to register and sign an agreement that, ha that has a particular set of terms of reference. So these, this contains these terms of reference. Um, there are data restrictions on how you can reuse data and, and around publication uh, as well. So there are those terms of reference. There are restrictions when you submit to GISAID about how you use the data. Um, there's a spreadsheet that you're going to see. I think there's, I don't know, five or six different pathogens that GISAID accepts data for. Um, each of those have a different template, uh, but they're very, they look a lot alike, um, but you can't change the template. The template is what it is. You can't add any extra information and you can't subtract. Um, I'm not gonna go over this. 
Um, the INSDC, as we've already discussed, uh, is a collaborative effort between three different nodes uh, around the world. So one is NCBI in North America, the second is uh, EBI in the UK, and the third is uh, DDBJ, which is in Japan. Uh, these are different centers. They mirror data that's submitted to each of these different nodes um, on a daily basis, but each of these are different centers. They have different priorities. They have different submission formats. They overlap, but they are not the same. Um, they do collaborate, and they have to map between each other's um, structures and formats, but they do do that, so that's very nice. Um, I just wanted to highlight that if you are considering submitting data to the INSDC, even though there are different submission formats, there are best practices for submitting to, to the INSDC and, and structuring your information. So basically, you can see the little figure on the right. Um, all of the data needs to be structured in a hierarchical manner, manner starting with a bio project. Um, all of your samples, which are called bio samples, go into the bio project. And this is where you put your sample information. Um, but you can also link to raw reads and assemblies and, consens and consensus sequences. And those have their own metadata. So um, the phage has come up with come out with a data object model, um, and that sort of specifies where to be putting uh, different kinds of metadata. Uh, there are also different biosample packages. Uh, they're called packages at NCBI. They're called checklists at ENA. But basically, these are collections of fields, standardized fields that were created by the Genomic Standards Consortium. Some are very general. Some are are very specific for different environments or different clinical types. Um, but as a general rule of thumb, if you're creating and sharing um, public health data, you can't go wrong with the pathogen packages. And there's two of those, one's for clinical or host associated, the second is for environments, foods, and all of that sort of thing. Um, one thing that people don't realize, though, is that you can add user-defined meta metadata to these packages. So you can add on any information that you want. You can actually take fields from some package, for other packages and add them into the pathogen package. So you can mix and match. Um, okay, I'm going to wrap things up now. Uh, we have, I haven't shown you how to actually submit to any of these places, and we don't have time for that, and we don't have data for that. Um, but what I am going to tell you is that there are step-by-step -step instructions available in protocols.io. Uh, these were created by Phage. And if you go to this uh, workspace in protocols.io, there are SOPs for submitting to ENA, NCBI, and GISAID. And they'll tell you how to create an account, how to create, set up a bio project, how to submit all the different kinds of contextual data. Um, and yes, so please do pop over there and check out those protocols. Um, this is just to say that there are a lot of career opportunities um, involving data curation and the implementation of standards. I'm not going to go through these things, but we live in a data centric world, so you can't go wrong learning uh, these types of skills. OK, so um, the take home messages are that uh, data curation and standards are part of quality frameworks. Um, Ontology-based data specs increase interoperability of data sets and systems. Data management tools like the Data Harmonizer help operationalize data sets, uh, help operationalize data standards. Uh, tools and best practices help build knowledge bases. Um, and data sharing is important for situa situational awareness, decision-making, and innovation. Um, data stewardship involves um, practices to ensure privacy, security, and trust. Um, and something that we didn't talk about um, is that open and access controlled public repositories have different advantages, but I think Will mentioned those yesterday. Okay, so thanks so much for listening to that.